all of us uh, have read the this uh, parable of a group of blind men and the elephant they had never come across an elephant before and so when each of them they try to know what the elephant is like so they started touching the elephant now each blind man feels a different part of the elephant's body so what happens that uh, you know naturally their description of the elephant would be different from each other and that's why you know they describe the elephant in a different way the fact remains that the elephant is a is a is an animal a huge animal but the description is given by all these friends differently now history is like uh, history writing is like this each of the historian would tell you a different story of the same fact and that is why you know history we say that is is such a vibrant discipline and you know it keeps on progressing every day so every new historian would come with a new story so i have this alternate version of the parable that i just mentioned there was a drunk man who has lost the key of his car in a dark night right now he searches for the key beneath the lamp post and uh, he does so not because it was here that he had lost it you know why he's uh, looking for the key just beneath the lamp post because it was here that he has found the light so as history researchers uh, what we have done we have been doing the same thing we have been writing histories based on such sources which which are easily accessible to us i mean you know when when i say that uh, what are these easy, uh, easily accessible sources all the written document that we find of any period of history so the documents of human archives i'm talking about but if we really want to find the lost key we have to go into the darkness because the key is actually in the darkness so the darkness i am talking about is the discipline with which we have not been familiar we need to look for evidences which different other disciplines just different from so social sciences especially sciences uh we have to take help from the sciences and science has offered before us uh, many of the informations so we have to go beyond these conventional sources that we as historians have been using so my talk today uh, tries to sensitize you to this unexplored and you know these unsung sources and as my title says the global climate anomaly and the mughal rule it might sound like such an absurd idea because i'm the you know i'm saying so because you know the main theme historiography uh, on the mughal history often projects 17th century or maybe the 16th century as you know the pinnacle of the mughal rule and it is uh, uh, illustrated as a sort of an exceedingly tight knit and bureaucratically very robust kind of a state so it's 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 a blooming empire that we know ab about the mughal state now i on the contrary am trying to tell you a story of an aberration of sort now that's that's something which uh, uh which might uh, uh, surprise you but let me give you a sense of what my story is all about uh climate actually played a very key role in the course of uh, human history not only uh, in india but also in you know different parts of the world and especially if you look at the 17th century europe has been uh, one area on which uh, uh, there has been a lot of research it has been well established through various historical and scientific evidences that uh, you know climate has actually played some role in the 17th century europe now the hardcore historical and uh, the corroborative evidences they indicate that the sun the sun uh the shining sun uh as a matter of fact went through a period of inactivity actually in the later half of the 17th century to tell you a more precise date uh this this uh, you know this kind of a uh, uh you know sun going into inactivity that i'm talking about it happened between 1645 and 1715 now in contrast to the uh, european situation the mughal state 
arguably thrived during this same period. And many would say that it was the crescendo kind of a high point of the Mughal Empire. And the Mughals actually reached the territorial maximum. So they moved in deep into the south. They went to western part of India. So it, they expanded uh, in a big way during the 17th century. So does it mean that India did not experience any kind of a climate variation during this phase of global climate anomaly that I'm talking about? Now, how did it affect the Indian agriculture? This is one other question that uh, might, you know, uh, uh, might come in our discussion. What impact did it have on the policy of the Mughals? So was there an effect on the treasury of the Mughals? Because agriculture, it is, uh, it has been uh, based on Indian monsoon for time immemorial. So what measures were taken by the rulers when you have some kind of climate-induced situations? Now, these are a few of the questions that, I, that uh, uh, I intend to unfold before you. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, climate uh, uh, as an important aspect of the 17th century, um, let me, let me first tell you that why at all the climate matters to us as history researchers. Now, during your early years of learning in school, uh, many of you, even I was told about this. Uh, so you must have been made to believe uh, by your teachers that many million years ago, the earth was very warm, isn't it? So it was so warm that even no living things could survive. So your teacher, must have told you that if there was lesser carbon dioxide, the Earth's surface would have been covered with ice sheet. You remember this? Now, at that small age, you may not have been able to connect as to how or, or you know we came to this age when you, we are living on the Earth and the population is growing. But the Earth became full of life all around uh, after many, uh, many, many years. In fact. Uh, it all, uh, uh, in fact, in many years ago, this planet, planet Earth, uh, uh, yesterday only we have uh, celebrated the Earth Day, 22nd April. So the planet Earth was very warm. And it was, you know, warm because it was full of rich carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, but, you know, this combination of heat and carbon dioxide actually led to gradual vegetation. And these vegetation, when I'm saying vegetation, this included the forest, the mangroves that we find on the sea coast. And this led to decrease in the level of carbon dioxide, because all these plants and the mangroves absorb the carbon. Now, another very interesting natural formation was the coral reefs. We call this uh, in environment terms, we call these carbon sinks. So you know, these Coral reefs, when they were formed, they acted as reservoir for the carbon. And these coral reefs also reduce the level of carbon from this atmosphere. Now, these all these factors together, the, the vegetation, the, the coral reefs, and the formations, these led to gradual cooling of the planet, and then it became livable. So the, this happened because the carbon dioxide blanket became thinner in the atmosphere. Now, for the same reason, today we talk about, uh, you know, that how deforestation is causing uh, problems for the world, for the planet. It's causing anxiety around the world because we we talk about uh, cutting of the forests and the, the and the trees, and we say that these trees, when we cut the trees, they release carbon in the atmosphere because if the tree is it is a living tree. It absorbs the carbon, but when you cut the tree, it will, you know, release the carbon in the atmosphere. So what happens that when you do the cutting of the forest, there will be sudden increase in the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Now this will lead to major change, and this will these changes will happen in in it will lead to changes in the climate as well. Now today, what we are doing, we are burning a lot of fossil fuels. We release huge quantity of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through different machines that we, we have been using. And of course, we are also cutting the forest uh, in all parts of the world. Now, at the same time, you know, uh, 
when all these things are happening, we, and we call this as an Anthropocene phenomena because it's all something that the humans are doing. So uh, you know, the Earth's capacity to absorb the carbon dioxide has, uh, it has decreased. So what is happening now that you have a lot of carbon in the atmosphere and the Earth's temperature is increasing today. So why I'm trying to explain you this connection between carbon dioxide and Earth's temperature? The reason is that in past, such phenomena led to uh, you know, drastic changes in historical events. And one such transformation was the, the global cooling of the Earth's temperature in the 17th century, what is famously known as the Little Ice Age. So it, it was an age of climate anomaly. Now, the, one of the leading uh, 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 astronomers of uh, uh, the late 17th century actually recorded uh, and, you know, these uh, absence of sunspots. When we, talk, when we say sunspots, sunspot actually is, uh, is an, in kind of an activity that happens uh, in the sun. So there was a complete absence of sunspots between the period that I just mentioned, 1614, 45 to 1715, what is also known as the Maunder minimum, the absence of sunspots. Now, this, this uh, absence of sunspots was known as Maunder minimum, and it was named as Maunder minimum after one of the British astronomers whose, whose name was uh, uh, Maunder. So he was the one who discovered the, you know, this dearth of sunspots that uh, during this period of the 17th century. Now, Sunspots during those years were seen with naked eye, and uh, uh, you know they. At that time, you don't have uh, you know, uh, modern devices like today, but at that time they watched it, watched the sun with naked eye by projecting its image on the plane sheet. And history has all these records of the bound the minimum. So we have records of different astronomers, like one of the famous astronomers of the time was Avelius who observed the sun at that time. So we have evidences, uh, uh, archival evidences to suggest that there was actually people were observing that the sun has gone into inactivity and this has led to, when there is an inactivity of the sun, of obviously the, the warmth released by the sun would be lesser. So during this mountain minimum phase, the shining corona that we, uh, we which is actually visible nowadays during every uh, uh, solar eclipse, it had disappeared. Now, this description by the astronomers uh, for the 17th century, uh, they mentioned that there was a dull light, the sun had become, you know, the, the ring has become not that much, uh, uh, it's not that much shining, it has become uh, a kind of a dull light, it has become uh, narrow. And so, you, you know, the, the, the corona that is normally formed during the solar eclipse is not so bright during those years of 17th century. So what I'm trying to suggest that all these evidences from 17th century, the documents from the 17th century suggest that the energy of the sun appeared to have diminished. Now it is a condition normally associated with reduced sur you know, surface temperature and extreme climate events on earth. Now, during the last two decades, there has been a deluge of research on you know, this kind of a, uh, 17th century environment history. And they use not only the traditional historical sources and records, but they also study you know, the changes in the climate, the, ch the changes that has happened in water, forests, and even diseases. Now, among such nature aspect studies, research on climate histories have largely been dominated by you know, Earth and climate scientists. And one of the very famous uh, uh, scientists of the, uh, who has worked on the climate history of the 17th century is John Alley Eddy. Is, uh, he, Eddy actually collected numerous information from historical accounts to prove that 17th century was a period of little ice age. And he's the one who had actually popularized this name, uh, Mounder Minimum. So the Mounder Minimum uh, name became popular after Eddy wrote a very interesting article about the 17th century. Now, Eddie actually corroborated these 70 years period 
1645 to 1715, with minimum sunspots after a very thorough analysis of all the available records of solar activity. In fact, his uh, if you read his article, he and if you look at the sources that he has used, he has included the records of the sun, you know, the sun spot observations by astronomers. In fact, he has also used the carbon-14 record of the tree rings. Now, all these records he has used to prove that there was actually uh, inactivity of the sun and the temperature of the earth became cooler. Now, today we are talking about the warmthness of the earth. That, that you, We talk about the global warming because there is so much release of carbon. Now, in 17th century, the reverse was happening. There was lesser carbon in the atmosphere. The sun has the release of the warmth that was released by the sun. It has got reduced. And this had led to the Little Ice Age in European history. Now, during this coldest phase of the Little Ice Age, uh, there are indications that you know the average winter temperature in Europe and North America was uh, some kind of, uh, 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 I mean, lesser, two degrees centigrade lesser. Uh, than the present uh, temperature that we find in Europe. So the entire northern hemisphere, particularly Europe, India is also part of the northern hemisphere, mind you. So the entire northern hemisphere, and especially Europe, this experienced uh, winters uh, of uh, very, you know, extreme, uh, uh, what do you call the severity. It was very severe. And the, you know what happens in Europe, it was much felt because when you have severe winter, the summer also became cooler. All right. So the winter period ex extended and the summer period, uh, the months of the summer actually uh, got decreased. So, uh, and in fact, uh, there are records which suggest that the summers were often very cool. And it, it was not only cool, it was also wet. So it, what has happened that when this kind of a, a phenomena is taking place for many years, for 70 years, it has led to the shortening of agricultural months in Europe, which led to 17th century crisis. So we know that there are many historians who have talked about 17th century crisis in different uh, other terms. But this is also one of the important factors behind the 17th century crisis. So climate as it was an important actually uh, factor which has been well-researched and in which has been proposed to be one of the important uh, factors in the 17th century crisis that we ha have been reading a lot. Now, uh, there is one historian. His name is uh, Jeffrey Parker. He looked at this, uh, you know, mounder minimum uh, phenomena, the, the global uh, cooling phenomena in a, you know, global perspective. So if you read his book, a very interesting book, Global Crisis. He blames the 17th century cooling for the catastrophe around the world. And he when he mentions all this, he also mentions about India. So, and not only India, he's also talking about, uh, uh, he also is also mentioning about uh, uh, Southeast Asia, he's talking about uh, America. So he's talking about different parts of the world and he says that, they, you know, 17th century was a period when there was crisis all around. It, he, he talks about the global crisis uh, all around the world because of the 17th century climate changes. Now, his major argument, uh, in uh, if you look at the book, it's a very thick book, but then the major argument uh, uh, that comes from, uh, that I have derived from his book, is that the cooler condition actually led to, you know, uh, led to different kinds of uh, crop failures all around the globe. And he says that there were also, you know, failure of the states because of the, the because of this uh, lesser revenue coming to the states. Now, there were increased uh, also, he also mentions about the increased levels of wars during those times. Now, <clears throat> When he's talking about these wars, he's, he's given different examples from different parts of the world. Obviously, 17th century is a period when you find that different parts of the globe uh, actually experience uh, 
wars all, all around. Recently, uh, sorry, uh, there is another uh, uh, environmental historian. Uh, his name is his name is uh, uh, Dagmar Degroot. He has a, written a very uh, interesting book. It was published just a year ago. It's called the Frigid Golden Age. And Degroot is although very uh, you know against such kind of sweeping generalizations that uh, this uh, this man uh, uh, Jeffrey Parker has done. And he says that you know this kind of uh, uh, generalizations cannot be done for the entire globe, and he's quite right. In fact, he thinks that you know the the implications, the economic implications of ice age are very complex. Now he, he's very right. If you read his book, he's although not talking about other parts of the globe, his his uh, work is confined to the Dutch Republic. But he mentions a few points that you know, Dutch Republic. Why Dutch Republic uh, prospered, whereas the other European countries were not, you know, prospering. They were facing crisis. So he's saying that you know there cannot be, you know, the climate changes cannot be the reason for the crisis all around. So there, the different parts of the world would have different implications. Now, obviously, the most staggering example for me. uh you know the the kind of a contrasting implications that uh, the 17th century climate anomaly uh could have is that of the mughals even if you say that 0.5 degree centigrade temperature would increase it can have diverse impacts and it can have sort of uh, uh disproportionate consequences for the society at large so the little ice age is actually also coincides with the maritime expansion of europe in the indian ocean and the creation of uh, uh, the colonial empires so then you find that different other colonial empires also prospered so there then there was uh, some kind of a uh, conflict between these colonial empires for the dominance of the indian ocean so the question is that if uh, little ice age was truly uh, uh, it, it's a well researched phenomena it has been proved that this uh, phenomena has it has happened but was it truly a global phenomena because jeffrey parker he has touched upon this incidence of droughts in different parts of india china japan different parts of the world but if you read uh, his book it's just a broad brush account as part of historical research uh, it's uh, it's very interesting to investigate the you know this kind of a climate anomaly uh, that it could have an impact in india so uh, the question that comes before us that did it have a similar impact on you know the tropical regions like india or for that matter uh, any other south asian region so we have uh, you know ocean currents we have uh, oceanic condensations the there are changes in the monsoon patterns in the indian oceans now they lead to succession of different climate events and today we uh, read about uh, the el nino phenomena the la nina phenomena all these oceanic activities and there are there it has been proved that these affect the indian monsoons now was this not happening in the 17th century so when we talk about india the indian monsoon has been the backbone of indian agriculture for the moguls also it was one of the you know the main source of their revenue now and uh, obviously uh, the one uh, oceanic uh, phenomena that has major implications on the indian monsoon is the uh, el nino phenomena and today it has been proved by uh the geographers and many scientists also that el nino has been detrimental to the indian agriculture because it 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 disturbs the indian monsoon so there is lesser rainfall taking place when there is an el nino phenomena now in the early 17th century or in the in the sorry uh, uh the 17th century there were many el nino episodes and this has been proved proven by different scientists through different you know they have a uh, different way of doing interpretation for those those periods so they have used different log books 
the descriptions given by the moving ships in the oceans and they say that in the 17th century there were twice as many el nino episodes episode when unusually warm ocean conditions arise along the tropical western coast of south america now see this entire ocean is connected to each other we should not forget that so when there is a phenomena happening in the very western part western coast of south america it can have an implication in indian ocean as well so it is a phenomena of rise in the surface temperature of the pacific sea and this causes flopping of the rainfall in india and this has been proven so <clears throat> if you read uh, the documentary archives from india including the log books of the british ships so i consulted many of the log books for, of the british ships that were moving in the 17th century because each of these uh, ships were supposed to maintain the log books now if you read all these documents they would suggest that the monsoon was very irregular between this period 1550 to roughly uh, uh 70 you know 1690s so the drought occurrence was much much higher during these years and it is uh, you know the evidence suggest that uh, there was possibility of one drought every 3 years now this gradually came down to uh, one drought every 6 years between in the second half of the 17th century but these you know in 17 in the second half of the 17th century the diff, the the, uh, the change that we observe is that these droughts are continuous for 2 years so you know it, it can if there is a drought taking place in one particular year it continues in the second year and this frequency of double droughts is actually happening so much in the second half of the 17th century now this means that during this period of the second half of the 17th century there were frequent el nino phenomena meaning that the indian monsoon was very much affected now on the basis of the empirical data of this kind of frequency of uh you know droughts or the rain fa failures in the second half of the century, uh, 17th century it may be argued that this might have uh, affected the harvest in a big way and this in turn must have affected the state in terms of revenue so if we are to believe the mughal documentary accounts it gives a different and contrary picture for instance if you read the mughal emperor shahjahan's accounts who ruled from 16 uh, uh, i think 1627 to uh, 58 uh you know it gives a different picture altogether it says that the mughal empire was actually prospering during those days now and it is true also because of the fact that he could not have undertaken huge construction projects if he if he did not have such huge revenue such as the taj mahal the lal qila that he constructed the shah jahan uh, bad that uh, he built so the jama masjid that he constructed now if this was not this possible without huge revenue at his disposal so in fact shah jahan built shah uh, when he built this uh, uh, shah jahan bad the new capital city it was arguably uh, the only capital city in the world in the mid 17th century in fact uh, uh, many of the accounts of the time mention that uh not only the mughal documents even the travelers who have come to uh, uh come to the during the reign of shah jahan they also mentioned that there this empire was such a huge empire with you know uh, with a huge length in terms of territory now now when they talk about these huge territories they say that it had actually given them huge amount of income uh, in terms of agricultural revenue the land revenue now one of the travelers of the time is uh, uh which i happened to consult uh, was ovington and he wrote that at that time in the middle of the 17th century the mughals had almost ruled an area which was half the size of europe 
So one of the added advantage for the Mughals was that this, it's you know, a, a, it had a huge the area which they controlled had huge peasant population, which lived in a huge fertile plain. So the fertile land that they uh, they possessed. Now they, that extended from Indus to the Ganga basin down to Bengal. So you know, even the Mughal accounts, if you try to look at the Mughal accounts, the they glorify the huge extent of the Mughal Empire. But we have to take such descriptions with a pinch of salt. You know why I'm saying this? Because many recent writings uh, have been influenced by such documentary evidences. And one of the books that, uh, which has become very popular in terms of global history is Victor Lieberman's uh, Strange Parallels. So he uses two phrases in that book. Uh, he calls this as protected zones and the exposed zones. And he kept the European countries of Southeast Asia in the category of the protected zone. Whereas South Asia, India in particular, he puts it in the category of exposed zone uh, uh, area, uh, uh, category. So it's, it's an exposed zone according to him. Now, they have been called... Uh, so, because uh, the why Indian territory has been called an exposed zone because he says that it was it was there was a vast stretch of Indo-Gangetic lane which was easy for the uh, for uh, uh, easy to invade by the Mongols whose main strength lay in the cavalry. Now, this is a simplistic explanation that he has given why the entire stretch of the Indo-Gangetic zone is. Uh, uh, is uh, is an exposed area. I have mentioned elsewhere uh, that uh, you know why this kind of a sweeping generalization for the entire Indo-Gangetic plain by Victor Liberman is not correct. But looking at the geography, uh, let me tell you of the this entire stretch of land uh, of the Indo-Gangetic area which the Mughals uh, had actually possessed, we actually cannot lump the entire land into one category. You know, there were geographical obstructions. There were rivers all around. If you look at the Middle Ganga Basin, basin, they, this entire region has many rivers all around. So this allow this did not allow the Mughal rulers to have a firmer control over the region. Now, having said that, it cannot be denied that the Mughals uh, did not have a huge area under their control for uh, revenue collection. And the most interesting aspect is that the 17th century, uh, the three rulers uh, of the 17th century, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb, the names that they choose, these were all imbued with absolute power. You know, look at the look, look at the titles that they have. Jahangir means the, he's the conqueror of the world. Shah Jahan, he means the, he's the king of the world. Aurangzeb. So, and then he, Aurangzeb, he has taken, uh, mind you, the title of Alamgir when he, he has uh, taken the accession. So, he, Alamgir means he's a world conqueror. Now, the point I'm trying to make uh, with these titles that the Mughal, all these three Mughal emperors have taken in the 17th century, that all these Mughal rulers had to maintain a huge military to lionize their image as world conquerors. And this was not possible without invading far off territories when you are faced with climate challenges. Now, it is for this very nature of the Mughal rule that they were also able to have huge revenue resources at their disposal in the 17th century. Now, <clears throat> obviously, the shortening of the monsoon period benefited the Mughals. And all the uh, you know, three Mughal emperors went on campaigns every year. They would, uh, if you read the Mughal document, they would say it would suggest that they will or will proceed after the, uh, the, the southwest monsoon had receded. And they would return to the capital ahead of the onset of the annual monsoon. So, you know, the radius of their travel is also very calculated because the Mughals travel all the time with all their paraphernalia and with their, uh, you know, the entire uh, courts. So they have to, they, they cannot move more than four or five maybe uh, miles a day. So this, this was something that, that the Mughals actually... Uh, had uh, continued in the 17th century. So looking at this uh, practically, the kind of movement that the Mughals had in the 17th century, uh, 
we can see that uh, it was very essential at that time for the Mughal rulers to to travel to these far off areas and control these territories and bring revenue from those areas. Now, having said that, uh, we also need to look at the period of Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb also from you know the 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 uh, the point of view of uh, the frequent monsoon failures that we just mentioned that there were frequent El Nino phenomena during that period. Now, obviously, I'm still working on this, but I'm not. Uh, I'm still uh, looking for some evidences to suggest that whether there were frequent uh, uh, rain failures. But there are many Mughal accounts which suggest about these. So there were failures of rainfalls in 1630s. Uh, uh, you know, there, there was a continuous failure from 1630 to 30. Two. Then similarly, in, uh, from 1658 to 60, there were continuous failures for two years. And again, it happened in 1685 and 87. Now, all these failures produced widespread famine. And this has been well documented in the Mughal accounts. So, And the most affected area during those uh, days, because of the failure of the monsoon, were the western parts of India, particularly Gujarat, and also huge part of the Ganga plain. Now, mind you, the Ganga plain is one area from where huge amount of revenue came for the Mughals. Now, one of the worst catastrophes uh, that has been uh, well documented uh, happened in 1630s, which continued uh, even in 31 and 32. And uh, there was virtually no rain that had taken place. And it has now been established uh, with the, the log books that you know this year actually is a period when there are El Nino phenomena taking place in the in the in the Pacific Ocean. So 30 to 32 is a period when El Nino phenomena is taking place and it is also a period of rain failures which has been well documented in the Mughal accounts and many of the travelers accounts also. So like Peter Mundi had uh, talked about the death of law huge number of population because of the you know the famine that had taken place now obviously uh, for rulers like Shah Jahan, uh, when they face with these kind of disasters the the, the these kind of challenges the cli climate induced challenges they respond to the disaster because he is the ruler so he has taken a series of measures when famine has taken place he establishes the soup kitchen, the arms houses, and this uh, this has been recorded in the Mughal documents, so because he fully understood possibly that these peasants who who are not able to cultivate their land, they are the backbone of the revenue uh, when the good monsoon years would come back. So, but then the question arises that despite this, you know, the huge expenditure on the famine relief, how was it possible for uh, Shah Jahan? to spend huge amount of money on his glorification. When I'm saying glorification, I'm talking about the amount of money he has spent on the Peacock Throne, the amount of money that he has spent on the, the construction of Taj Mahal, or for that matter, even the Shalimar Garden at Lahore. Now, all these huge expenses were not possible without the invasion to new territories. Uh, if you read uh, Abdul Hamid Lahore is uh, uh, he has, uh, he uh, has, in fact, devoted uh, well over half of his pages and images uh, about the campaigns of Shah Jahan forces. So Shah Jahan, as you know, he, he, he was able to seize Kandar. He went to Afghanistan. He crossed the Khyber Pass. He's obviously, he, he failed in the Balkh region, uh, uh, the Balkh region, but uh, the uh, Balkh region of Afghanistan. But there were uh, there are evidences uh, which suggest that you know uh, he failed there because there were uh, severe winters in that part of Afghanistan. There were huge snowfalls happening in the 1640s, and uh, it reduced his campaign season. So uh, and it also affected his you know the quantity of supplies that he needed uh, for the uh, bulk um, campaigns. Now, when Aurangzeb became the ruler, there was another very, uh, you know, continuous famines from 1658 to 60. And there were failures of monsoons. Even, the, you know, the, the prices 
increased in these regions of uh, not only in Delhi but also in different other parts of uh, India. So Aurangzeb is also uh, one ruler who is said to have abolished many of the taxes, even you know, not in order to give relief measures to the hardship faced by uh, by the people. Nevertheless, uh, you know this the 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 fact remains that the state has been faced by these challenges of climate and there has been rainfall failures so the treasury of the state would be affected in fact uh, if you read the uh, sources of the time it would suggest that the revenue for orange treasury fell by almost 20 percent during these continuous famines from 1658 to 1660. in fact uh, I was reading Shireen Musbi and she has argued that the crisis of the 1658-60 uh, uh, period was sort of a uh, uh, watershed for, uh, for the Mughal expansion and the decline that has happened in, you know, in the uh, 18th century. Now, but when he's faced, even ruler like Aurangzeb is faced with these challenges, he has to enhance its revenue to sustain the empire. So Aurangzeb too follows a policy of expansion of the Mughal territory. He conquers Deccan, he conquers Bijapur, Golconda. He, you know, he has remained uh, 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 in, in fact, campaigning in uh, uh, Marathwara region uh, for many years. I think 20, 25 years continuously in that part of uh, India. Now all this is happening because the rulers have now to enhance their revenue. So what I'm suggesting that, you know, when there, these rulers, the Mughal rulers are faced with the challenges of climate, they take different other measures. They have this leverage because of their huge army to expand to different other territories. And that, that is the kind of measure that they were forced to take in order to enhance their revenue when they are faced with the challenges. Now, the hypothesis that uh, I have presented before you is still, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, still a work in progress. But it is probable that uh, Mounder Minimum and the changes in climate had some, but very not very similar impact on India. You know, if you con contrast it with the European situation during the same 17th century, the uh, 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 it has a threat. So if you read the accounts of the Mughals, you will find the Mughal tre treasury has increased during the same, same period. And it is considered to be most uh, prosperous of uh, the uh, Mughal uh, in Mughal history. So the two rulers, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb, are, are considered to be the period when you have the magnificence of the Mughal Empire taking place. So you have uh, the construction of huge monuments taking place. <clears throat> now. I'm still trying to pull together more uh, kind of natural and archival data to understand the real impact uh, that the Indian monsoon had in the this long 17th century. But I'm surprised that for early modern period of history, why we have confined ourselves to the conventional sources. Now this, despite the fact that uh, much of the material such as, you know, we, the sail, as I mentioned, the sailing ships, and the log books that they maintain, they have been around for centuries. And yet, you know, what we see is that the historians have not used such sources to write the history of 17th century. Now, these logs include very interesting data. If you read these logs, you will find that they mention about the tides, they mention about the winds, they mention about the ocean currents, they mention about the climate and the weather. Now, all the, which is ultimately actually affecting the monsoon patterns of the mainland in India. So how is it possible that you are setting aside all these important informations of the 17th century and explaining the 17th century without considering such sources? So as I mentioned, we have you know, two categories of sources that we may, you have the natural archives, and you have the human archive. So the documentary archives that we talk about are basically human archives. So in human archive category itself, you have these log books, the logs maintained by the ships. 
but then you also have very interesting natural ar archives which and the information of this has been given by uh, the scientists we have data for the last 1000 years now from the scientists to suggest that what kind of tree rings activities have taken place now the tree ring activity is actually connected to the rainfalls so even for india we have these informations about the tree rings for the last 1000 years we have information about the you know the ice cores the marine sediments all these informations can be good take you know uh, can be used by the historians to do their analysis to the, to do their interpretations for the 17th century not only 17th century many other centuries now, <clears throat> now this is so relevant because the case of india is uh, uh, is uh, very important in the 17th century by because in 17th century many of the european ships have been traveling in the indian oceans uh, so overall uh, what i am trying to emphasize uh, and what I have suggested you is that if we want to understand the early modern period better in a better way or more holistically, we need to consider climate as well as uh, you know you know other kind of sources that I just mentioned as important components. We have to consider these sources. We have to consider these informations related to climate uh, to do our analysis. And when I say so it has certain internal logic because my logic revolves around the conviction that you know the the uh, the mughal historiography has not been able to present the true and the complete picture 